Hi folks, welcome back. This week we're going to be talking about the skeptical philosophy of a Scottish philosopher named David Hume. Hume was a philosopher of the Scottish Enlightenment uh, who lived from 1711 to 1776. Uh, as you can see, I've got a little help from Sam on this video. Uh, we'll see some videos later that he made. And, uh, and this is probably the Welsh spelling of Hume's name, uh, um, or Sam's spelling. Uh, Hume was a, uh, an empiricist philosopher, and we've talked about what that means before. Empiricist philosophers reject the idea that there are innate ideas. They think that all knowledge comes from experience, uh, and Hume was committed to that view. He was also committed, if you'll recall, to uh, what we called the theory of ideas. He understood uh, all of the, the inhabitants of the mind, all of the things that are in our mind, as what he called perceptions, and he divided those into impressions and ideas. Impressions are more lively and vivid, uh, whereas ideas are the less lively and vivid copies. And everything that exists in our mind, every, I, every perception that there is in our mind, uh, comes from, according to Hume, some impression. So his method, is, his philosophical method, uh, is to trace back each of our ideas, uh, each puzzling idea that we encounter, to the original impression of that idea. If we can discover what that original impression is, then we will understand what that idea is, uh, and we will understand whether we hold it on good grounds or not, whether we are justified in continuing to believe that idea or to hold on to that idea or not. Um, so that's just a little reminder of some things we've talked about with Hume already. Let's start with a little example. These are some videos that Sam uh, created this morning. As you can see, we have here a few collisions. We have some examples of causation. One car strikes the next and the next moves off in the opposite direction. Basic physical causation. What is our idea of causation exactly? What exactly do we mean when we talk about a cause? What exactly is our idea of cause and effect. Well, Hume begins by thinking that our idea of cause and effect may be uh, the idea of contiguity and succession. By contiguity, he just means that the uh, impression of the causal event and the impression of the effect event happen next to each other in space and time. So when the billiard ball strikes the other billiard ball, when the cue ball strikes the other billiard ball, the immediate cause of the, the second billiard ball moving is the cue ball striking it. That event of striking happens in spatial and temporal contiguity with the movement of the second, uh, the second billiard ball. Uh, so it's contiguity. And it's the idea of succession. The one event always succeeds the other. The event of the cause uh, is succeeded by the event of the effect. But he says this isn't quite enough because it's not sufficient just to have, uh, it is insufficient to have merely contiguity and succession. That is, Contiguity and succession alone don't amount to causation. There's something more going on. So what is this extra bit? Well, the extra bit that's going on, Hume says, is a constant conjunction between the causal event 
and the event of the effect, a constant conjunction between cause and effect. That is, we see them happening together over and over and over again, that the cause, or that the event, the effect always attends the cause of that type that it never occurs other than that. So contiguity and succession give way to this idea of constant conjunction. Causation is this idea of constant conjunction. And this idea has within it the idea of a necessary connection, a necessary connection between the cause and the effect. The effect, the, the cause does not happen without its attendant effect following upon it. The attendant effect is not possible without something's causing it. So there is this necessary connection between the one and the other. They are, we cannot conceive of the one, it seems, without conceiving of the other. So Hume's question. When we reason, we draw upon the evidence provided by our present perceptions, by the impression that is before our minds, and in our memory of past perceptions, by these ideas that inhabit our minds. But we then go beyond these to infer how things will be, given the way things presently are, and how they have been. Given that the first car is racing down the track toward the second stopped car, we infer that there will be a collision and that the stopped car will move. Given that the cue ball is rolling down the table toward the eight ball by the corner pocket, we infer that there will be a collision and the eight ball will move, hopefully falling into the corner pocket. We suppose that there is some necessary connection between what we presently experience and what we are about to experience we form an expectation about what is going to happen next. This is a causal inference. Hume's question then is what is this necessary connection? What is the basis of this causal inference? Do we have a right to make such an inference? Is this connection, is this inference, founded upon reason. Well, in order to, to focus his investigation, Hume reminds us that he has already said that uh, if reason or the understanding establishes anything, then it must either be a relation of ideas or a matter of fact. So we will ask, is this necessary connection established as a relation of ideas or as a matter of fact. All things that can be known or believed fall into these two categories. Relations of ideas are things that are known a priori, prior to having had any experience of them. That the inside angles of a Euclidean triangle sum to 180 degrees, or that 2 plus 3 equals 5, these are relations of ideas. Reflection upon the idea of a triangle or the ideas of 2, 3, and 5 are all that we need to know that these claims are true. They are, Hume would say, demonstratively certain. They are bits of demonstrative knowledge. And by saying that, he means that their denial implies a contradiction. To deny that the angles uh, of a triangle sum to 180 degrees is to involve oneself in a contradiction. Matters of fact, on the other hand, are things learned from experience. As we've said before, they are a posteriori, and they depend on the way the world happens to be. They're not demonstratively certain. They're only probable. They're the result of probable reasoning. And their denial does not imply any contradiction. They don't involve one in a contradiction. So it's true, for example, that Philadelphia is north of D.C., but someone who thinks this is false doesn't believe a contradiction, only a falsehood. We can conceive that it, would ha it could have been otherwise. It could have been the case that D.C. was in fact north of Philadelphia, but it could not have been the case 
that 2 plus 3 equaled something other than 5. So is the connection, the necessary connection between cause and effect, founded upon a relation of ideas? Well, Hume says, no. And it's enough to recognize that the events of a cause and its effect are distinct events. There's nothing contained within the idea of the former that implies the idea of the latter. It's just the case that we expect them to attend one another, but when we examine the idea of the cause, when we examine that present impression, all we find are its sensible properties. All we see is that which we perceive. Nothing about it implies that the event or that the effect is going to come about. The sensible properties don't reveal the objects, as Hume calls them later, secret powers to bring about its effects. To get what he means here, think about an aspirin. When you look at an aspirin, you see a white uh, round pill uh, and it might have some writing on it. It might have come from a particular bottle. It's a particular shape and size. But just from looking at that pill, if you have not learned from past experience that aspirin cures a headache, you would have no way of knowing that that particular pill that you were holding was intended to cure a headache or would have the effect of curing a headache. Nothing about the present impression of it implies that it has that secret causal power. Similarly, Hume thinks when we examine any cause uh, we find, or any event that we want to call a cause, uh, we find the same thing. We never see in that cause the secret power that will bring about the effect. We simply uh, draw that conclusion for some reason, but it can't be on the basis of a relation of ideas. No contradiction is implied in thinking of the cause without its being attended by the normal effect. The first car might careen down the track, uh, strike the second, and then both might come to a complete stop or the first might reverse its path. None of these ideas is contradictory. So to illustrate, this is perfectly conceivable. Unlikely, surprising, but not contradictory. So if it's not a relation of ideas, is it perhaps founded upon a matter of fact? If it were, it would have to be something we learn from observing multiple instances. That's what the constant conjunction of causation implies. But there's nothing in each additional instance that was not already observed in the first. All that was observed in each are the basic perceived properties, the sensible properties of the objects, not their special powers. To dig a little deeper, though, let's focus on the inference itself, the causal inference itself. From the present impression of the car careening down the track to the idea of the impact and the second car moving. From the present impression, I infer that this impact will occur and that the second car will move. What justifies or supports this inference in this particular case? Well, I've seen cars in the past strike one another in this way. Uh, I've seen this happen many times in playing with these, uh, with these sorts of uh, toys with my kids. I see one car strike the next and the second car roll off in the opposite direction uh, or see them wreck and fly all over the place. Uh, and so I've seen, I've got all of these past experiences and on the basis of these past experiences, 
I infer that when this car in this present instance strikes the car in front of it, it'll push that car that's in front of it. It'll cause it to move. Well, what am I relying on in making that inference? Hume says I must be relying on something that we call the uniformity principle. Instances of which we haven't had experience must resemble those of which we have. The course of nature continues always uniformly the same. Nature will continue going on in just the way it always has, and we can expect it to do this. Now, notice, if we accept the uniformity principle, if that's right, if instances of which we haven't had experience must resemble those of which we have, if the course of nature continues always uniformly the same, then we have no problem reasoning from our past experience in which a certain secret power attended an object of a certain kind to the conclusion that in the present instance, the same secret power exists in an object of the same kind. Right? We have no problem inferring from our past experiences of seeing matchbox cars ram into one another to what is about to happen when, in this present instance, this matchbox car runs into the one that is directly in front of it. Uh, we can draw that inference on the basis of this uniformity principle. Well, should we accept the uniformity principle? We can't prove it demonstratively, for we can conceive of nature not going on in the same way as it does now. We can imagine that the sun won't rise tomorrow. We can imagine that uh, that when the car strikes the car in front of it, it instead rolls backwards or just both of them stop in their tracks. These are things of which we can conceive, and if we can conceive of them, Hume says, then they are uh, not logical impossibilities. They are logically possible events, and so they are not ruled out by demonstrative reason. We can only support the uniformity principle, according to Hume, on the basis of probable reasoning. But there's a problem here, because probable reasoning is itself based on the idea of cause and effect. We could only support the uniformity principle by noting that in the past, the uniformity principle has held up. In all of our past experience, the uniformity principle has held true. Instances of which we haven't had experience have resembled those of which we have. In all of our past experiences, we've found this to be the case. But why should we accept those past, past experiences as a guide to the present experience? Well, because in all past experiences, we found them to be a good guide. So they are in the present experience. But why should we accept them as a good guide? Well, because in all past experiences, we found them to be a good guide. And you see where this is going. We found ourselves in a vicious circle. The uniformity principle is necessary in order to justify the uniformity principle. So what's Hume's skeptical conclusion on the basis of this line of reasoning? He concludes that the idea of cause and effect is not founded upon reason. It's neither founded upon a matter of fact nor upon a relation of ideas, so it is not founded upon reason or the understanding. As such, we cannot know that nature will go on in the same way. We're not justified in believing this. And we cannot know that an effect will always follow its usual cause. We're not justified in believing this. Nor could we know that every effect must have a cause, or that every event must have a cause. We have no good reason for believing that. And we cannot know that the conclusions arrived at by inductive, or what Hume has called probable reasoning, should be accepted. We can't know everything we've learned by inductive reasoning. That means the sciences are in real trouble if we accept Hume's reasoning. 
Now note that there's a difference here between Hume and Descartes. Hume is not skeptical about the existence of the external world. We can know about matters of fact. We can know that, uh, we can know the contents of our present experience. We can know what the world is like, but what we can't know is what the world will be like in the next moment. We can't draw any conclusions from our present experiences, and that means we're missing out on a lot. Hume has an answer to this. He gives what he calls a skeptical solution to this problem. He says that causal inference is something we do by customer habit, not on the basis of reason. We don't learn to reason causally by observing and understanding the world. Rather, it is a habit of our minds to make the inference from cause to effect. It is just the way we are. We customarily, or on the basis of habit, make this inference. We can't help but do it. This position has come to be known as Humean expressivism, that the causal inference, the uh, the commitment to understanding the world in causal terms is an expression of uh, the way that our minds work, the way that we understand the world, but does not reflect necessarily the way the world really is. Causal properties may not exist out there in the world. Causal relationships may not exist out there in the world. They may just be something we impose on it. All right, I hope you find this edifying. I hope you find this interesting. Hume is one of my favorite philosophers. I think he's a joy to read. I think his positions are interesting and challenging. And so I look forward to discussing them with you uh, when we reconvene on, uh, our, on uh, our online platforms this week.